really excited to be here on the webinar first fix the cyber plumbing what's broken in cyberspace and how to fix it a couple of quick uh, you know things to talk about please use the audience feature questions feature rather to interact with the with the panelists we have several things we want to talk about and the panelists, if obviously if you're not talking, please do go on mute. And we are going to go straight ahead. Okay. Um, Cyber Management Alliance's webinars are a little bit different. We do not have facilitators. Um, myself, I'm on the left. Amar, I also am, I know what I'm talking about, technical or non-technical. So we are all kind of panelists all at the same time. I'm joined by Adam. He was going to give a brief introduction about himself, and then I'll give it to Nash. Adam, over to you, sir, first. Great. Thanks, Amar. How are you doing, everyone? Uh, my name is Adam Gladstone. As Amar mentioned, uh, I work for a company called Nominet. Um, I am the head of product delivery, so I work on overall product strategy and product management for our DNS products and services. Thank you, Adam. Nosh? Hi, my name is Noshad. I'm an IT security specialist and also deep web and dark web analytics and also cyber PhD researcher and Deacon Dapur. PhD researcher. Thank you, Nosh. So a couple of things for the audience I do, and, and the panelists. If I do interrupt the panelists, it's only to get some questions in or because time is running out. So please do not get offended by that, everybody. And we're going to go straight in. Um, one of the things I do is alternative titles. Um, this is kind of gives a little bit of insight into how uh, the panelists and myself are preparing the presentation. Um, you know, this is simple, what's DNS? I think many people on the webinar can relate to the fact that many, many people don't understand DNS. Then the other one, the other title was, that's not the DNS wolf, as you can see from the image there. That's the wrong one. Um, I like this. I think many of the panelists also like this one. Cyberspace Jenga. DNS is, in my opinion, and hopefully everybody joining in agrees that if you pull that one, possibly everything else will fall down. Um, before we do that, so I think some people have already started to look at all the free downloads. Um, I'm really excited. Actually, this one, we have three separate download documents for all the audience members. Um, very briefly, we have the case study, DNS case study, multiple case studies you can download. We also have a mind map, a professional mind map that we created for DMARC and SPF. And we also have a very interesting must-read document by the National Cyber Security Center in the UK which is Active Cyber Defense, one year on. Uh, we're going to talk about this uh, one year on document uh, a little bit more in detail. So while you're listening to this, please do uh, download the documents. And you can obviously, you know, uh, well, there's one more thing we're going to share with you towards the end of the webinar. So we're going to start carrying on. This is a little bit of what we're going to talk. We're not going to spend time on this. Now, in a nutshell, in my opinion, and I speak to many people, I run Cyber Management Alliance. I do a lot of trusted advisory. I've been a CISO. DNS is one of those things that most people, I think, misunderstand or they just assume it's only for good old web surfing. In my opinion, I think DNS, the, the role that DNS put, must play needs to be further up and much more measured and given more importance. Adam, I'm going to turn it over to you. What are your thoughts on this first? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, at Nominec, we, we work on analyzing and monitoring DNS traffic. Um, it, it's part of what we do, and the insights that you can glean from DNS are really unmatched as far as overall resiliency and what you can apply to uh, an infrastructure. So just looking at general communications and seeing how pervasive DNS is, with all the various touch points and how that's exponentially growing, uh, you really can't underestimate how important it is um, 
to look at that DNS traffic and keep an eye on it. Um, so, yeah, th there's no doubt that all those various titles that you have are all applicable here, um, it, certainly because the, the bottom can fall out in a house of cards, so to speak, very quickly. Due to the open nature of DNS, um, it's really inherently insecure. So it's, it's ripe for the taking for bad actors. Nosh, I'm not going to let you in now uh, because Nosh is going to give everyone more details on how Nosh is also a sort of ethical hacker, just for the record. He does a lot of good, really, really cool technical stuff. And Nosh is going to discuss how he hacks DNS and uses the weaknesses in DNS to conduct the hacking that he does. So I'm going to move on. If, again, I, I encourage the audience. If you have any questions, you can use the question feature. This is just a very, very, very brief summary. I'm not going to spend again time on it. DNS is basically something that converts a name to the actual IP address. Humans find it very difficult to remember. I'm going to give this back to Adam. Can you spend a minute explaining what this is, please, just for those sure. for the baseline? Yeah, sure. At its highest level, DNS is is a distributed database. It's a hierarchical tree structure. Starting at the very top, it's kind of an inverse tree, so to speak, because you start with the root at the top, um, which is really represented by a dot. There's 13 root servers um, that are administered by ICANN, which are really the starting point for any sort of recursion. So at its core, DNS is all about requests and responses to uh, to served up traffic. So a host wants to traverse to a site and there is a mapping that needs to happen between uh, host names and IP addresses. So those URLs needs to be translated so they are readable by digital assets. So looking at the very top, you start at a root server level and then you go down to uh, the top level domains, which in our case are .uk, which is uh, what we handle from an authoritative perspective. Dot com, which would be handled by a VeriSign, the authoritative sources for top-level domains. And then as you traverse down the tree, you get into second-level domains and other hosted domains. There are all authoritative components to this, and there is a recursion that happens. So there is an, a repetitive approach to asking questions and getting responses that would start up at the root. The root would respond with the authoritative answers to where they can find uh, the .uk and then specifically, as you go down that tree, it traverses down going backwards. Excellent. Uh, thanks for that. That's a brief summary. And we're going to carry on. Now, to me, and I think everybody else here, and, and the panelists, to me, DNS, the best way to describe it is the bedrock. It basically is the foundation for everything else we are doing. Every, uh, I've got to mention Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and everything else relies on DNS. And as the Internet of Things uh, becomes more prevalent, you know, we are still going to rely on DNS even more. So uh, ignoring DNS, in my opinion, my professional opinion, at your own peril, because securing DNS and actually utilizing DNS to make an organization more cyber resilient is what is really key. Now, I've got some interesting stats in the next slide, something to do with 4 billion queries per day. Adam, what exactly are we seeing here? This is representative of the actual .UK authoritative traffic that Nominet would see typically on a given day. So the, the graph on the right there is overall traffic looking at our various name servers. On average, we see anywhere between three and five billion queries per day, which equates to a couple thousand queries per second. But working with various customers and larger organizations, um, we typically can see up to about 225,000 queries per second and even up to a million. So the scale for DNS is uh, truly astonishing when you look at it from this sort of perspective and having the ability to really glean insights and get down to a single data packet is critical to really understand what's happening within all of that noise. So this is kind of a high level view that we would look at typically on a given day at uh, .uk. I'm going to interrupt you for a second, uh, Adam. You sure. said this is just the .uk figures. What does that What does that translate into? So, if we, what would be the crazy figure for everything else out there? 
Out of hundreds <laughs> of billions? Yeah. Um, yeah. Because wow. Uh, again, you know, dot UK, I think, um, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I think dot UK is the fifth largest country code, right? So if wow. you look at that and kind of look at that, you know, and expand on that, yeah, you'd be looking at the over hundreds of billions. When you look at dot com and dot net and some of the dot org, some of those larger ones that really are quantifiably uh, order of magnitude larger than dot UK. So you're looking at hundreds of billions. And, and you also said something which caught my attention. You're saying that at any time, sometimes you can have much more than 3,000 queries per second. What was it, 225,000? So, yes, when you look at, at much larger organizations, to put things into perspective, right, so five, five billion queries in a day might seem like a lot, but there are large enterprises that see 50 billion within a day, um, especially ISPs that serve up traffic on a routine basis to that effect. And keeping in mind that .UK traffic, we're not seeing every single response request that comes in. A lot of this is cached, right? So really it's only traffic that is not cached that we're going to see here. So we're really only seeing a portion of that overall traffic, but those ISPs see all of that traffic coming in, which is why it's exponentially larger. So we're talking of a seriously large amount of data um, in terms of queries, billions, hundreds of billions of daily mm -hmm. traffic that pretty much every uh, device, every uh, camera, everything else is using. Well, exactly. And, and with IoT and, and the transition over to IPv6, I mean, you can only imagine again, order of magnitude and how much larger that's going to get. Wow. Wow. Um, Nosh, I'm going to ask you to jump in a little if you don't mind. So what are your thoughts on these crazy, uh, to me, to shock me a little bit, to be honest with you, figures? Actually, when you look at the traffic vector, it's more than what we see. Um, I'm not sure this is how old the traffic, um, the queries are. I know, um, as you know, that today is everything rely on the DNS. It's our backbone of everything. If we mm -hmm. fail to configure DNS correctly, have medication and specific needs of modification on the server level, especially DNS queries, we will have uh, so much of impact. We we'll, we ex experiencing many companies experience. They don't even know they are they, they, the DNS server being used for certain type of attack. Um, okay. it, this is a uh, biggest worry because like you say, you know, let's fix the pump. That's the main, main, more crucial. I, I, I would, um, as a attacker point of view, uh, nowadays we are not interested in looking into SQL injection or SQL injection, MySQL. No, we are, they, now the attack is more compliant on DNS-based attack, malware, ransomware, and flooding quite large number of companies. Even the big companies are, you know, as you know, in the spam hosts get attacked massively. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna discuss that a little bit later. Excellent. Yeah. Well, Nosh, thanks for that. So yeah, just to carry on from the theme, Nosh, DNS is, again malware ransomware relies on DNS, and I think yeah, the image I have here, I, I really like this image. I found it online. Uh, I did pay for it just for the record. This image is interesting because um, we had the shadow brokers test any yeah. and weaponization of advanced malware in most most cases relies on and will continue to rely on the ability of DNS. I mean, as you kidders is the best word to put it, but the amount of data, the amount of intelligence that someone could get from looking at the DNS and making sure it's properly configured, I think it's, uh, to me, it's really crucial. So, Adam, I've got one more slide I just want to uh, talk about. What are sure. we seeing here? I mean, uh, this is something you, you shared. One example of what exactly does this show then? Yeah, this is really looking at risk levels um, when breaking down some of that traffic. So, Typically, obviously, what we looked at before was specific to .UK traffic that we serve up. But when we work with other customers, we break down their actual 
DNS traffic. So um, typically, we could be breaking down threats in a variety of ways, looking at percentage of overall traffic. So on the right-hand side in that pie chart, you have a variety of different um, threat and configuration factors that could impact performance and that could heighten overall risk for your company. So obviously, in this example here, you see a, about almost a quarter of the pie being infected, uh, that detection of any way of malware. Um, looking at the overall events detected, you can see a breakdown that of the um, 236,000 different events, malware constituted 200 unique queries within that. And then you have a further breakdown of, of phishing. One of the other areas that you'll see um, of exfiltration. So they might have had a larger, unique set of queries, um, but a smaller number of overall events detected. But these are some of the major and, and primary, I guess, use cases uh, for DDoS. When you look at, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, for, um, for threats, DDoS being a prevalent one um, that we can see, but really general characterization of malware behind all of these uh, is really how we, how we operate and what we can uh, very sizably detect. So just a polite reminder to the audience, uh, there is one question that's come in. I'll, I'll look at that a bit later. Uh, a reminder to the audience, the attendees, uh, if you're listening in live and for those who want to listen in later, there are three different documents you can download, uh, multiple case studies on how DNS is used for defense, a mind map on uh, DMARC and SPF, how to stop email spoofing, and active cyber defense, a really great and very insightful document produced by the UK uh, National Cyber Security Center. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Nosh, I want to go to you, buddy. Um, when you do ethical hacking, um, I must stress on the ethical fact, when, you do, when we do penetration testing for companies, how much, um, you know, in your opinion, how much intelligence would, would an organization be able to glean from DNS. I mean, we've got some stats on the screen, but what are you? What is your opinion? In my personal experience on DNS um, detection, attack vector detection is um, when you dig into DNS servers of of a client, um, they're always 99.9% .9 always they're shocked to see is this happening inside our server or mm -hmm. are we part of the botnet? Are we part of the DDoS attack? So because the amount of, because DNS is not widely monitored in, uh, in most of the organizations, um, you know, tier one to tier three uh, type of organizations, it, it is just a, a, a sitting uh, stone, stone on, on mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. the servers and routers. So if you know exactly what I mean. So these contribute and collaborate a series of um, you know, criminal, criminal activities in the server. When, so the companies, when they see the logs, when we show them the uh, effect of, of, of the systems, uh, the logs, and they always, you know, strike to see that they're surprised, you know. Yeah, and, and you know, from my experience, a lot of the time I've, I, I've been a CISO and I still do a lot of trusted advisory. Um, DNS is often something that just works and nobody pays too much attention to it. It it, it, it works. A, most of the time, it is configured uh, relatively okay, but nobody else gives it a second thought. Um, mm. It's almost the abandoned, you know, uh, kid, if I may, that everyone yeah. thinks everyone knows it works, and because it works, nobody asks the question, "What else are we doing with DNS?" Um, I think one takeaway for everyone listening in: maybe you should ask yourself. Are we utilizing everything that DNS has to offer? And we're going to cover that in the next minute. Adam, yes. um, can you share with us DNS attacks? Pick one, two, or three of these, and can you share with the audience some of the inside information and, and exactly how these happen? Yeah, sure. So uh, we can start with, well, let me start with actually the second and third one, because those were specific attacks really going after the, the DNS infrastructure, right? Um, which was interesting because most of what we talk about and what we think about is how DNS is just used as part of other attacks. And these were specific ones looking at the actual infrastructure itself and in turn taking down sites. So the first one was uh, DreamHost. This happened um, August 24th 
of, uh, of last year, so at the end of last summer. And really, this was on the heels of a lot of the protests that were happening over here um, around Charlottesville. And they were starting to shut down some radical sites. And as part of that, there was a DDoS attack that went after uh, DreamHost, which was uh, an actual registrar. So similar to a, to a GoDaddy that would actually sell and host some of these sites. So it was taken over to them. And what it did is it took part of that DNS infrastructure offline for a certain amount of time. Mitigated after a few hours, but that was a little bit of a, of a precursor to my next example, which was with Dying which happened in October of 2016. At the time, I believe, was the largest um, DDoS attack, which has now been uh, eclipsed by what happened at GitHub just a couple weeks ago. But with Dyn, it was a, a much larger attack that came in several waves. And it really challenged, for, for those of you who don't know, Dyn is one of the largest managed DNS providers that um, services up traffic and resolution for sites like Twitter and PayPal Spotify, some very obviously large, well-known sites, um, and for a period, took down the ability to get to those sort of sites, Netflix, I believe, in, being included in that. So that was one of the first targeted attacks against the DNS infrastructure, I believe, that, that were on record or at least had that sort of coverage. Um, they were able to really get it under control by the third wave of that attack, but this lasted several hours. So, again, mm. looking at magnitude and looking at the need for resiliency, even within your own DNS infrastructure, that kind of brought a lot of those lessons to the forefront. So the idea of secondary DNS coverage really came into play and has been a hot topic since the, uh, since the Dyn attacks. So I think those were two of the, uh, the critical ones that, to cover here. Um, there so a are, question for the yeah, – sorry, go ahead. No, no, sorry. Sorry to interrupt you. A question yeah. for you. Could the DYN dying attack, um, and again, I'm not asking you to predict, or you know, but in your opinion, could it happen again? Could it, would it be much more catastrophic than before? The answer will consistently be yes, um, mm. because it, until we have more attention and focus on DNS resiliency, um, absolutely. There's no reason to believe that, that it couldn't. Of course, there's... The lessons that are applied to this as far as that resiliency, so the attack would happen in different forms. But that's the, that's the scary notion of cyber attacks is the creativity and innovation that as an industry of bad actors and negative influence really have, that they're coming up with creative ways to, uh, to forge new attacks. Yeah. Just a polite reminder to the audience, thank you, Adam. Uh, you can download three documents, case studies on DNS, mind map on DMARC, and active cyber defense one year on by the UK government National Cyber Security Center. Uh, Nosh, I'm going to go to you for a few seconds um, or a minute or so, actually. Um, you know, there, you, what you can see on the screen now um, are several, you know, uh, I guess things you can do with DNS attacks. Uh, can you tell the listeners about how you would do some of these attacks from the kind of a hacker perspective? Um, yeah, um, I just gathered a couple of um, top five uh, mm -hmm. DNS attack, uh, distributor attack vector from the list of what we have here. Mm -hmm. um, the first one I select um, to say DR DDoS um, is one of my favorite type of um, um, and reflexive um, attack type, which is very easy to, um, you know, um, to to create um, a type of attack which you mm -hmm. simply um, needed to obtain the, your victim's uh, DNS IP address. And uh, you know, to, to, to create attack uh, DNS uh, amplification, um, uh, we need to understand the science behind the amplification. Um, actually, um, science, um, how the DNS work. So, for example, uh, in a, uh, when you type www, you know, google.com and the DNS will send back X amount of traffic. You send, you send mm -hmm. um, five, five Mbps queries uh, and then your router go out to DNS and it send back a 10 uh, Mbps queries. So this is the science behind the DNS. So if you put into a perspective of attacker type, you can see five turn into a 10 when you return back. So what mm. if we, instead of me receiving, instead of you receiving, let's say you are an innocent person, 
uh, mm-hmm. uh, sending a DNS request to a, a server, and the server returning back with 10 pound, 10 MBBS. So what if you can turn the return uh, a DNS query into a victim uh, at a, a victim server? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that is called DNS amplification. And then you put another question on top of that: What if we have a hundreds of botnet asking the same question? Mm-hmm. WWOMA and sending the entire flood back to the victim without you even noticing that your server is participating a botnet DDoS attack. You have a no clue what's going on in the infrastructure. Your IDS system, your IPS system, your SIM system will not going to detect any attack what's going on on, on your system participating in, in terms of a certain type of attack. In the similar way, there's the one I explained to DNS amplification, DNS cache poisoning. It is one of the most dangerous kind of cache poisoning where you can do to a victim. Uh, the impact will be in the course of DDoS that the server will go entirely numbed. It's, there's mm-hmm. no use mm-hmm. for the server after that. And uh, you know it, it, it give you um, um, you know the, and the, the the way the cache poisoning is work is the, is, is is specifically um, uh, your login page your credential credit card agents information etc etc et that's how the cache poisoning work the attack vector work uh, you know the third ones I want to pick up on on the DNS um, sorry I, I, I'm going to interrupt sorry. you sorry uh, give yeah, me give sure. me a second. I've got a question yeah. from the audience saying how easy uh, to, I think he's asking two, yeah, he or she is asking two questions. How easy is it to launch a amplification attack, the one that you talked about? Um, yeah. That caught a lot of attention of people listening in. And yeah. then how, what would you do? Maybe Adam can take, how, do, how would you stop it? But you first, uh, Nosh, Nosh, how easy okay. is it to launch the amplification attack? Like I say, it's very, very easy. As long as if I know your DNS IP address, that's all I needed. Uh, attacker point of view, um, you just have to send the query and spoof into a victim's IP address. Okay, so the return for so basically, I'm paying you, you paying back to somebody else. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. multiply, multi, you, you can you can write the script to multiply the amplification result. So let's say you say, I'm telling you, I'll give you one pound. You multiply this one as an interest, the hundred pound. So you pay to somebody else because I, I will put a return uh, amplification address, somebody else IP address, which is had to be my victim's IP address. So the flood go to the interesting go to the victims attack. So it's very simple. I, I, I know the explanation is quite hard, but in in the terms of practically, it's very simple. One line okay. of script can sorry. turn down. Yeah, yeah sorry, uh, Nosh. I'm going to tell all the listeners we have another webinar. If you look at the Cyber Management Alliance uh, channel, Bright Talk channel, and this is where Nosh and Adam and myself we're going to go deep dive into actually. Uh, what we call breaking the internet. Um, so that's when Nosh is going to share some of his scripts. Obviously, he's not going to share them now. Um, but yes, we will. We will. We are going to share some interesting insight on how uh, cyber criminals could literally break the internet. Adam, um, yes. on the on the amplification, anything, any any thoughts on how protection? What would, what would we have to do? Yeah, well, at a high level, you, A, you need a tool that's going to look at signals and analyze traffic. And Nomina, that's, that's what we do at its core. So we look at various signals, we baseline traffic, and then we look for those anomalies and outliers, right, to see those sort of spikes. So A, you need a tool that can analyze traffic and in a predictive nature, look and identify uh, an anomalous event, and then be able to do a characterization of what's happening within that. So by overlaying various threat feeds, looking at newly observed domains that have come online, you can start to build a profile of what's happening within that event. Once you identify that based on those IPs and domains, you can then, um, through policy generation or configuration, whether it's an RPZ or uh, another policy for your systems as far as a firewall or an ACL, you can then blacklist those IPs. So Mm -hmm. you can try and stop Mm -hmm. it in its tracks. 
Okay, well, that's cool. And I think we're going to cover that uh, when we look at the National Cyber Security Center's uh, one year on documents. Some very interesting insights. A polite reminder yep. to everyone again there are three documents case studies, mind map, and one year on. Uh, please do download them and read them. They're all very good documents. Uh, Norish, before I let you go, DNS tunneling, data exfiltration. How and can share some ideas or share some thoughts on that? DNS tunneling is very uh, interesting um, in terms of. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Yes, yes. Yeah. One second, just give me a second. Mm -hmm. Norse, are you still there? Okay. Norse might join back in later. Listen, guys, this thing's happened. So a polite reminder to everybody, do download those documents. And we are now going to move on to something really interesting, which is the uh, this one here. Okay. So for everyone who is going to download the Active Cyber Defense one year on document. I highly urge you, I strongly urge you rather to read that, but I wanted to take the opportunity to obviously, you know, where credit is due, kudos to the National Cyber Security Center and Dr. Ian Levy, the, the gentleman who actually authored much of the document. So highly recommend you download that. It's a very interesting read. But what we're going to do today briefly is going to look at, and in this document, uh, Dr. Ian Levy particularly calls out DNS as one of those technologies that you know is being used to protect uh, and detect in, in terms of threat intelligence, but also more to protect what is happening within the the larger kind of country, if I may. So, um, Adam, before we read some of the stuff on there, do you want to give us a little bit of insight as to what is in this document? So essentially, this is the breakdown of the active defense, uh, active cyber intelligence that uh, Namina has been working on with the um, National Center for Cybersecurity over in the UK. We've been providing a full solution working with them and the public service network um, to provide not only a managed DNS service, but also a blocking service um, so that part of what we were discussing before, as we identify certain events and apply those signatures, uh, we can block that traffic in its tracks to mitigate and minimize the risk and the threats that they observe. So this is kind of a look at one year in at some of those findings and how effective it's been um, to, to that end. Okay. Now what I wanted to focus is everyone can see this on their screen. What's really interesting in this document, I've, I've taken out some interesting uh, bits of information from this document that you can download. And what it says is domain generation algorithms. Uh, actually, for uh, Adam, quick insight into the domain generation algorithms. Yeah, this really is a type of malware, and it plays into kind of the DNS tunneling and data exfiltration. Um, it's a way for, for bad actors to randomly generate a whole series of various domains that they can use then from a command and control perspective to exfiltrate and send data pretty much openly. So what it will do is that it will encapsulate data within a packet header so that it's allowed to go from inside the network out to get through the corporate firewall with port 53 really being left open and unhindered uh, to allow for internet traffic. And then it is deciphered and unencapsulated on the other side. So passwords, uh, trade secrets, sensitive information can actually be sent uh, securely via DNS uh, using domain generating algorithms. Um, and so we look very closely at that using what we call the, well, not what we call, using the Markov chain, which is a scholastic uh, prob probabilistic model in statistics to identify what the likelihood is that these, uh, that sort of activity would be associated with malware. So looking at DGAs, it's really looking at those domains and we automatically assess the probability that that is not human readable. So with DTAs, okay. you have a non-readable uh, um, uh, composure to it. I understand. So just quickly read uh, what Dr. In uh, says in this document. 
um, basically the domain or way of malware authors to make it more difficult. Um, however, blocking known DGAs is relatively simple. Now, now what is in the next slide is really very important if everyone pays a little bit of att attention, is where they go on to say, what about unknown domain generation algorithms, DGA algorithms that are unknown? Now, this is where I found uh, what I was reading from Nominet very interesting. One of the analytics run on the names requested is known as the Markov analysis. This particular statistical test, blah, 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 you can read it on the screen here. Now, um, Adam, if you don't mind, I'm going to move to the next screen related to this that shows what you or how you would detect uh, something of an unknown DGA algorithm. Yeah, so expanding on what I just gave as an explanation of what the Markov chain is, how we go about doing that is incorporating those third-party feeds. So going back to that model of how we detect anomalous traffic, when we apply those signatures now, we're looking specifically at applying that, uh, that statistical model to determine whether or not something is human readable or not. So you'll see kind of in a gibberish form that is how DGAs are formed as domains. So uh, without needing to go in and do some sort of filtering on your own, we can break it down to individual packets as we see these spikes and look at the actual source and destination, look at those domains and determine that with the incorporation of threat intel fees that that is uh, a DGA or even the probability that it could be. So that's where the incorporation of newly observed domains uh, also comes into play as a feed where we look at new domains that are coming online very quickly. Okay, thank you, Adam. Just to give a brief heads up to everyone so that everyone's on the same wavelength, and I'm going to keep it a little bit simplified here, but DGA and the fact of DNS, how it all plays in, is even advanced malware in many cases requires DNS so that it can call back home is the way I explain it. Um, so for advanced malware, when it needs to call home, it still needs DNS and DGA domain generation algorithm, known and unknown, are a key component of the whole advanced malware uh, setup. Now, I just want to take one question, which is really interesting, and I'm sorry to that uh, gentleman who's put three questions, and I'll take the top one that he's put in, he or she. Um, one of the last sessions complete uh, in uh, okay, GDPR, is the need to address DNS triggered by GDPR only when seeking to protect websites from DDoS? Um, is the need to address DNS triggered by GDPR? Uh, in my opinion, like I said in the beginning of this webinar, GDP, uh, DNS is crucial to almost everything running smoothly, but DNS is also crucial to many, many kinds of attacks succeeding or not succeeding. So if you address uh, the DNS layer correctly, as we are discussing today, you should be able to uh, uh, detect, prevent some maybe, and I'm not saying 100% protection at all, but you should be in a much more better position uh, to be more cyber resilient when it comes to many kind of attacks. Some of these attacks, no doubt, are going to be, uh, uh, if I may, trying to steal personal information, which will be which will put you in very interesting position against GDPR. A quick polite reminder to everyone, you can download the three documents uh, from this particular webinar. Um, and I'm going to quickly jump back a little bit, if I may, to Nosh. You, were, uh, you had a bit of a power outage. So, Nosh, if you don't mind, take the audience through to what you were talking about, DNS tunneling and data exfiltration attacks. The, D, the concept of uh, DNS tunneling is originally designed as a simple way to bypass um, in the captivities of portal of network age, but which may many things on the web that often used to negotiate the purpose of the data pay, payload can be added in an organized, organized way in a DNS manipulation in use a method that can command and control way to data exfiltrating from the data from which is normally the systems work as, a, as, as unintentionally. But the hackers started using the, the pay, uh, turning into their data payload um, into a DNS 
a flood way but you will see if you, if you look at the, if you look at the logs of dns tunneling you will see lots of um, somebody close their eyes and create a xyz at dot com so you know you will see a multi different type of example of of data exfiltration using a client sending queries uh, with a record where the data is is encoded within the host name itself um you know i need to show you a couple of example of that's uh, later on yes we talk about that yeah. in the next webinar yes yeah okay then Nosh, thank you so much the, not, no, mm, sorry yeah go, go ahead yeah in a nutshell is that the, the, the you when you look at the when you look at the data exfiltration uh the, the point of view it, it they have they use a two different type of, they use as a, a junk text message dot example dot com so the, the the message have nothing to do with the, the, the subdomains have nothing to do with that but it's encrypted encoded name and as a host name they use it yeah so we're going to for those listening in again and those listening later we have another webinar where we do talk about breaking the internet where we get Norsh and Adam and myself and we talk much more technical and we look at some attacks in more detail uh Norsh thank you for that I'm going to go back to the um the National Cyber Security Center from the UK the document that they have produced briefly we touched upon domain generation algorithms which are really key uh to a lot of advanced attacks many advanced attackers and even nation states in many cases do use these particular algorithms to generate domain names that they can then use to exfiltrate data and to receive further instructions adam what is this is this is taken from the document adam so what are we seeing over here what does total blocks mean what is all of this about yeah, so this breaks down some of the traffic and some of the events that were seen over various weeks over over the course of uh, what we're looking at here is a couple months. And it looks at the number of customers. It breaks down the total number of queries that they saw with the total blocks and the unique component to those blocks, right? So even though you could see an increase in the total block number of traffic uh, during a certain week, the unique component of that is really what's of value to us there because it can be uh, repetitive. And keeping in mind that not all of these events um, could be significantly dangerous, uh, but as far as identifying threats, putting those blocks in place until they can be investigated further, you're really looking at the unique nature of that. So um, overall, it's fairly significant amount of traffic. Again, relatively speaking, uh, you know, there are gonna be elements that are much more than that. But you know you're still breaking down over over a billion uh, a billion queries within uh, a certain time period and looking at the total number of blocks and the unique nature of those events. So briefly, Adam, what is unique block in this case? Is this is this does this mean six thousand two hundred and eighty unique callbacks? Yeah. So those who talk about unique events, so unique IPs and domains. Wow. Wow. That's a lot in what a week roughly yep breaking it down for uh, less a week. Than per week wow so and, and it shows you document, mm, sorry go yeah. on yeah i was going to say what's interesting is right i mean when you look at the consistent nature of the unique block per week you know th that we mentioned earlier about the creativity that's being used i mean these attacks come in in different form and fashion all the time so the idea and notion of unique blocks of the same size and magnitude each week, it just consistent flow. I mean, what's good to know is that uh, criminals also take a break during Christmas, I guess. <laughs> everyone has um, to celebrate in some fashion, so yeah. Everyone has to celebrate, so depending on the country of origin, if there is a holiday in that country, you probably will see a slowdown in attacks, which is really interesting and funny almost at the same time. But right. again, I have just a polite reminder to everyone, this, uh, what you're seeing on your screen and much more is in that highly recommended document that you should read. Um, I don't normally place the praise the government, but in this case, NCSC deserves a kudos. They've done a great job. The document is very easy to read, even for those who are not very technical. Um, Adam, moving on to something again relating from that document, which is really interesting, is one in six, uh, a, most organizations, one one in six of the organizations using 
the nominate service have had some security issue discovered that required investigation and remediation. Now, now to put that in perspective and relating back to what we were seeing in this table, what does protection actually mean in this case? Does it just block the, the callback? What happens? Yeah, well, I think it goes to the idea of that just because unique locks does not necessarily mean a uh, heightened threat. So it means that one out of these, one out of uh, one in six of the organizations using this had a significant threat that required further analysis and remediation strategy put in place there. Um, so percentage wise, still pretty significant, which means it's the severity of those actual findings. So we're blocking a lot of traffic. We're putting uh, measures in place to protect the resiliency of DNS, but we do the active analysis on top of that. So we look at more the impact of what's happening there and work with the NCSC and other companies to really build hardened strategies to how to deal with this in the future. So that's really what's, uh, what's being denoted there. So I have a question, and, and uh, how much threat intel, in my opinion, I, I, I have my opinion, and I'll share this with the audience, but in your experience, because you, you do this for your bread and butter, I guess, is the best way to put it, um, how much threat intel, usable threat intel, can you get from uh, correctly monitoring and, and, and digesting and using DNS properly? A significant amount, especially at volume. Um, there's a lot to be offered because of the number of use cases, type of attacks, and looking at sheer volume of traffic. Um, probably more so than most other Intel feeds. It's why DNS-based Intel feeds are becoming much more prevalent in the marketplace mm -hmm. and being used by such, whether it's passive DNS or something specific to companies. The combination of those two factors creates a very intriguing uh, and relevant data set that can be used effectively. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. And I, I think for the audience listening in and uh, live and those listening in later, if you are not looking at threat intel, forget everything else. You need DNS for your employees to surf the web. But I would highly urge exploring using DNS links uh, for threat intel because that, I think, like we keep saying this, I know we've driven the message home a few times, without DNS, pretty much all of Internet would stop. And conversely, a lot of bad stuff needs DNS for, it, for the bad stuff to work properly. Um, now, I'm just going to go one more slide on this and on, on what the NCSE document is saying here, which is really interesting, is over the coming months, they talk about in this document, proactively analyzing the blocks in order to see what further information. And then the next paragraph, which is really interesting, in the last six months of the year, the domain generation algorithm, DGA, has discovered that 10 customers had confirmed malware infections. Now, again, that's just uh, reiterating, Adam, what are your thoughts? That's reiterating what we're discussing. Yeah, yeah, it really shows the pervasive nature of what they're seeing there. Um, malware infections come in all different shapes and sizes. So the idea of malware doesn't necessarily mean that it's lethal, but it means it could be, it could be something dormant sitting in a network, though, that could still be having some low-level form of communication that could be used and weaponized, as you mentioned earlier, at a certain point. Uh, it's really, it goes to show, I think, the, the breadth that we're seeing. You know, we've worked with customers that uh, didn't have, you know, smaller, large organizations, small DNS infrastructure, didn't think there would be a lot of value there. But at a high level, what we were able to find very quickly at different parts of their organization and that structure is really astounding and really eye-opening to them. Um, so in this case, very similar you know, a lot of these things come in different flavors, so the dormancy of them doesn't necessarily mean that you're not under attack. And I think that's an eye-opening perspective for customers that just because you, you don't see any net effect on your network doesn't mean you're not infected. You're, you're just as susceptible as everyone else. Yes. And, and, and generally, as you were saying, a, lot, a medium to large enterprise has so much DNS traffic that the DGA, the Domain Generating Algorithms, quietly get through most of the times? Oh, very often. And like I said, and they could be sitting there. A lot of these, and Nosh can probably attest to this, a lot of these sort of attacks do kind of sit and work in the background over a period of time, collecting information. What we've seen so much are trends and patterns denoting practice runs, 
for certain sorts of attacks, which is so interesting, right? Um, we saw that with an attack on a bank back in 2015, that there was an actual practice run that happened with a smaller signature of the same actual DDoS attack that went. It just goes to show you that just like any other business, I mean, this is a well-developed, mature industry that operates as a business. So they literally, you know, they will do sort of practice runs. So again, it just lends itself to the idea that just because you might not be seeing a net effect doesn't mean that you're not at a heightened risk. No, and I think, um, and again, Noah Schultz is going to be uh, hopefully agreeing on this, uh, but from my experience, um, cyber criminals are, are pretty much flying, uh, if I may, fighter jets. All the rest of all us organizations are using propeller planes and trying to fly, you know, the, but, the, but the problem is um, organizations are not necessarily focusing and, you know, on the plumbing as we, as we titled this particular webinar, DNS is seen as the basic infrastructure plumbing without organizations fully utilizing and leveraging the benefits that DNS uh, actually brings. And like I said, I know I'm repeating myself, folks, but highly recommend you download the document Active Cyber Defense and the other two and read it because kudos to Act, uh, National Cyber Security Center. They, they openly talk about how they are using DNS, a, a really basic open quotes, many people call boring technology, you know, to, to protect themselves and, and become much more cyber resilient. I'm going to, um, we, we are, again, you know, the, uh, a, I, the reason this webinar is for 75 minutes is just because Bright Talk normally cuts us off the minute we have uh, once the time is up. But uh, normally this uh, webinar will last about maximum 60. We're almost done. I do want to stress one more thing. Um, I have twisted Adam and uh, the other person I'm working with in terms of I have twisted Adam's arm, uh, not in reality, uh, so that uh, he will send everyone a, what they they were not willing to share this online, but they will uh, email everyone this particular document. Uh, uh, another very interesting read. Highly recommend when you do get it, you read it. Um, uh, if you uh, uh, technical, and this is how they basically did the WannaCry ransomware. Um, I want to thank everybody else, but before I do, I do want to kind of close, give my thoughts about the power of DNS and the fact that actually we need to understand the full uh, kind of impact and benefits that DNS brings. Nosh, uh, you want to go on mute after you say a few words, please. Um, my final word is to ask yourself a question that, you know, are we adequately protect our DNS? Okay. Are we looking at the DNS queries where these records are generated from? These are the questions I want you to live with uh, and then work upon it and, and defend yourself, um, you know, get the expert to look at it and see because the DNS is a backbone of everything. If once the hackers get hold of it, the game's over. Um, I mean, you you end up in participating um, a crime bigger than you you can even imagine. And because okay. now we have a GDPR on the store on the on the on mm -hmm. the step, so I want I encourage everybody to look at especially look at the DNS queries where the records are coming from. That's the that's my final Excellent. word. Thank you very much Josh, for the thank opportunity. You. Uh, until until the next time when we talk about breaking the internet. Um, Let's uh, see. Adam, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Adam, last few words from you, sir. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks. First of all, thanks, Amar, for, uh, for including on this. This was, uh, was very fun for us because we really enjoy uh, looking into DNS, which, again, is not known to be a, a very, uh, quote-unquote, sexy sort of technology. It's old, it's antiquated, but as such, it is really desirable for bad actors to leverage. And as we pointed out here, it is the plumbing of everything we do in the online digital world. Um, most companies don't have appearing and understanding or the inclination to look into that, A, because it's misunderstood, and B, because it's, it's hard. Um, and most of what's out there as far as cyber defenses are reactive. DNS gives you an element and the capability to be proactive and kind of go on the offense, so to speak, with some of these sort of attacks. So uh, it, it's really effective. Here at Nominet, we take a lot of pride in what we do on building up resiliency through DNS. 
Excellent. Adam, thank you so much. If there are a few more minutes if, if the audience does want to get in any questions. Um, there are a few questions coming in on GDPR, and all I can say, folks, is this is not a GDPR webinar. However, the reason we are talking about DNS is DNS is the bedrock uh, of a significant amount of attacks. Even nation states, uh, the advanced nation states, re states require some sort of DNS to work in many cases. So if, if you need to focus on one technology in the next few months, ask whether you are leveraging DNS, whether you're configured it uh, properly, whether you're securing it properly, whether you are using threat intel from DNS properly. So you can still download the documents after this webinar is over. Please do leave us with feedback so we can always constantly improve our webinar. And remember to register for the next one on our Bright Talk channel, which is about breaking the Internet. Uh, thank you, everybody, and uh, have a good one. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Nosh. Thanks, everyone. Take care.